Welcome back. We're broadcasting live from Metabolic Health Summit 2022. We just had a great interview with Thomas DeLauer, and before that, Robert Lustig, and we've had more and more interviews coming your way. And now I'm thank so thankful to be joined by Dr. Lucia Aronica. So wonderful to have you here. I've spoken with Lucia and interviewed her many times on Zoom, and it's just not the same on a computer screen as being able to say hi in person. No. So welcome, and tell me about the excitement and so what you're feeling so far being here at Metabolic Health Summit. So thanks for having me. Uh, it's so exciting to be finally back in person. The energy of, of being really in person with people, uh, it's a whole other thing. So thank you for having me. Oh, of course, of course. I'm looking forward to your talk. So tell us a little bit about what you're going to be speaking about. Yeah, the title of my talk would be The Genetics of Keto, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. I will try to present this very... Uh, like sciencey topic in a, a layman person uh, language and make it make it entertaining. So uh, I by the end of my talk, people will be able to understand how genes can affect the way people respond to a keto diet, identify the good, the bad, and the ugly information on their genetic report, what really is helpful or not, uh, and evaluate whether or not uh, a genetic testing can help them uh, find out whether keto is right for them. Yeah, that's such a great point because genetic testing really has blossomed in terms of its availability for people. But the interpretation of it is a completely thing altogether. And so someone may have one gene that says, oh, you have a hard time with saturated fat. So they'll say, oh, I've got this gene. I can't eat saturated fat. But it's not so simplistic as that, is it? It's not so simplistic. So in, uh, in my talk, I will uh, distinguish between uh, two types of genes, symphony genes and solo genes. Okay. Symphony genes play in big networks with each other and with our environment. Yeah. So it's, it's like an orchestra that really... Uh, modulate the melody, the symphony of our biology and response to keto. And there are solo variants, solo genes that can alone, independently of other genetic and lifestyle factors, dramatically change the melody of our response to keto. But these variants are very rare. Yeah. So, you know, these are mutations that usually lead to inborn errors of metabolism. So it's very unlikely, uh, the, unlikely that people carry an anti-keto or a pro-keto gene. Uh, Most of the genes they will find on their reports are these symphony variants. They have very subtle effects on uh, the way they respond to a keto diet. Yeah. And most importantly, only a few of those symphony variants are based on studies done with people actually following a keto diet. Yeah. So... There is very little good uh, in, uh, in the nutrigenetics of keto. And people need to learn about that. And that's why there is also the ugly part. The ugly part are the symphony variants of keto nutrigenetics that are listed as a contraindication to keto. Whereas new science shows they might be neutral or even be an indication for keto. Yeah, so if the study was done, someone following a standard American diet to say you have trouble with fat, that's a whole other story than on a, on a keto diet. So that can be really confusing for the individual. And, and potentially misleading. Yeah. And, you know, uh, the one of the ugly variants I will talk about is the EPOE4 gene. Right. The EPOE4 gene is a... Um, is, E4 variant is a variant in the EPOE gene, um, and the, the apolipoprotein E or EPOE is uh, the main cholesterol carrier in the brain and plays a key role in the in the regulation of glucose and lipid metabolism. And the E4 variant is uh, the single strongest risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's disease. But the risk highly depends on lifestyle factors, including an obesogenic high fat diet. So a diet that is high in both fats and carbohydrates. And this has led to the misconception that the E4 variant is a contraindication to a keto diet. Oh. And it's often represented as such in most reports. Yeah. And you need to think that each that one in four people carries at least one copy of this variant. Right. So one fourth of the population presumably is predisposed to fail on a keto diet. 
right? right? And so this is totally misleading, especially because new evidence from case reports and randomized clinical trials shows that actually for ca uh, uh, carriers that have mild cognitive impairment can improve their cognitive function with a keto diet. Right. So here we go, the mis potentially misleading advice. And so people really need, I, I work in the nutrigenetics field. I, I, I do now clinical trials in the field. So I, I think there is, a, there is a, a role for nutrigenetics in personalized medicine, right. but we need to educate people and um, especially when the when because nutrigenetics is becoming more and more popular, there is the risk that people yeah the 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 the, the, the direct to consumer field goes too fast, faster than science, yeah. reaches people and people are confused. Yeah, it's such yeah. a good point because people are sort of on the one hand they're hungry for information, yeah. and the market sort of rose to meet that hunger but the interpretation was sort of left out to dry, so to speak. And so that trial you mentioned, that was interesting because it was a trial showing that a ketogenic diet was able to improve um, cognitive function and uh, activity of daily living and so forth for people who are struggling with cognitive impairment. And it was both for APOE4 and APOE3, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. There are already a couple of trials showing that, both with a standard ketogenic diet and a modified ketogenic diet Mediterranean ketogenic diet with uh, more vegetables and fish and uh, uh, lower saturated fats. Right. Um, both diets have been shown to be effective for if E3 and E4 carriers in mild cognitive impairment. And the mechanism is, uh, um, so the hypothesis is actually that the E4 variants was the ancestral variants. So about 200,000 years ago, all humans carried the E4 variants variant and so the hypothesis is that this variant might have made our ancestors brain more efficient at using um, ketones as a fuel because the, the, our ancestral diet was more a low carb by fat diet but the same variant the e4 variant might have made our brain more sensitive to the chronic consequences of a high glucose environment, especially brain insulin resistance and consequent cognitive decline. So there is a probably the mechanism by which uh, ketogenic diet is helpful is first of all, just to provide an alternative uh, uh, fuel to glucose because people with mild cognitive impairment have a brain, a glucose hypo metabolism, so an impaired glucose metabolism in the brain. They can use glucose efficiently as a fuel, and so ketones can, uh, can just provide an alternative fuel. And the second mechanism is really like, and this is the nutrigenetic part, probably like the E4 carriers are genetically predisposed to thrive better on ketones the brain is, right. is uh, actually is a, a pro keto variant in this uh, in this first under this perspective so it's it's a uh, yeah it's such a great example that some would list it as a contraindication but the way you just explained it it is an indication exactly. instead yeah it, it and, might be right this is a uh, the evidence around the uh, uh, efficacy of a keto diet for e4 carriers is still preliminary but promising and for sure pr provides a proof of concept for using a keto diet as a one element of a multimodal interventions for cognitive health. It will not be the only uh, intervention. You, other aspects are important, sleep, exercise. Uh, but the point is that a keto diet might be one of those elements and might be effective. Well, and that sort of brings it to another area in which you're also an expert in with epigenetics. And yes. there's this concept that just because you have a certain gene doesn't mean it's going to manifest in you the way it manifests in everybody else because it's affected by your environment. So I, I, I guess that plays in the same way, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. So nutrigenetics is, uh, 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 is the way our genes can affect how we respond to a diet. Uh, the flip side of that is uh, nutri epigenetics which is the way the food we eat can affect our gene function so is uh, nutri genetics is from the inside out and the uh, nutri epigenetics is uh, outside in and together they're called nutri genomics my specialty is actually epigenetics i was born uh, as a molecular biologist working with a uh, unicellular organisms, figuring out the molecules that um, make epigenetic happen in the cells. Um, uh, 
but then you know now as uh, i I'm working more on personalized nutrition and nutrigenomics, which are the both sides of, of the of the coin. Um, I'm also um, in the context of a low carb diet. I have analyzed the epigenetics and the one one epigenetic modification in particular called DNA methylation in the context of the diet fit study, which is to date the largest randomized clinical trial ever undertaken to compare low carb versus a low fat diet. This was not a keto diet. Um, was a low carb diet, and there were um, that become became one year trial, randomized clinical trial. But it was very low carb in the first three months, and then became more like um, a mildly low carb diet. So at the end of the year, it was 130 grams of carbs in the low carb group. Yeah. But yet, what is interesting is that I looked at um, uh, DNA methylation across the whole genome in the eight biggest losers of the study, low carb and low fat, both. And the changes in, in epigenetics were completely different between the two groups. So despite a, a significant overlap, nutritional overlap between the two groups over time, yeah. we still see completely different epigenetic changes. So, you know, uh, uh, obviously diet is a powerful signal for epigenetics. And uh, epigenetics is probably a molecular mechanism that, that can explain many of the benefits that we see on a low carb diet. I call it the Deus ex machina. In uh, from is a Latin. I don't know how you pronounce it in uh, in uh, English, but is a uh, is a uh, you know the the magician behind the scene okay. uh, that explains why things that we see happen. Yeah. Yeah. So is, is this one of those fields where sort of the more you dig into it, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know and there still is? No? It's still, it's still uh, such field. But, you know, I believe that there is a practical use of epigenetic right now, which is an educational use to say you DNA is not destiny. Right. Actually, nutriepigenetics diet leads DNA, not the other uh, uh, way around. Right. And... Uh, uh, I, I teach a class on diet and gene expression, and most of my students join the course to understand the power they have on their own genes. Right. I also teach a little of uh, nutrigenetics, especially the one that is more um, useful. There are practical um, applications, for example, um, there are genes that can uh, uh, affect the way people uh, uh, absorb uh, omega-3 fatty acids and uh, response to, to uh, other types of vitamins. This, are, this is a practical information and people can start applying it uh, uh, right, right, right away. But I also teach that DNA, uh, diet leads DNA and uh, nutrigenetics is sometimes more important. They feel empowered and they understand. So I I am perhaps an idealist, but I think I'm a scientist. So I, I believe that science can drive behavior change. And especially now that there are more and more people becoming citizen scientists and uh, become, taking their health in their own hands. And they want also to understand. So I think knowledge can drive action and uh, empower people. Yeah, I love that word, empower people, and how, how the knowledge you're giving is helping people feel empowered and know that they have a stake in their future and it's not all predestined. That's so important. And then, but then also to be a, a realist about it and be like, and acknowledge we can get carried away with too many or too strong interpretation of some of the genetic tests. So you really, you do a great job of striking the balance in your message. Thank and I you. really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I really look forward to your talk. So thank you. Lucia Ronica from Stanford University, another great find and a great interview. So stick around and we'll have more live streaming interviews from Metabolic Health Summit 2022.